Duplicate. Oh well. Oh, yeah, I, it's on duplicate here. Um, okay, so the first thing that we're gonna look at. Are you seeing the screen now? In Zoom, I'm sharing. Okay. So there's um. <laughs> So now um, I hope everyone got to process and uh, we know that there's like usually some hiccups because maybe someone didn't select some files or, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong already. Um, there were like many, many different parameters to set, um, but you really get kind of like a hang of it as soon as you do that more often. And if I get a new data set, I don't have to like optimize all those parameters, right? So I know it's like 10 minute gradient, the same reverse phase method that we always use. And um, also like it's an orbit trap instrument of like HF or whatever. So I kind of have a feeling for those parameters already, but I can also very quickly, and that Stefan tried to show, like can very quickly use all those views to look into data and make my assumption from there. And so just one thing I want to see who did did not manage to process. Let's do it this way. No, no one. Okay, that's fine. That's great. Okay, so and so, what did we actually produce? Um, you have to switch from data files to feature lists on the in the tabs here. Um, we can also close the processing wizard, but really, I encourage you to save those presets just to kind of keep them. And. Now, if I have the feature list here, you can see that each individual sample now has extracted ion chromatograms on the bottom here, and then the newer uh, set of lists, uh, one above the other. Yeah, so we did multiple different processing steps to extract features, and you can see the newest one on the top. And if we just double click on any of those, and I selected the EICs here, um, you can see that there is uh, the feature list opening. It always starts with the lowest retention time. So it's usually some like bad, bad feature shapes, bad chromatograms that we look at. But if we just uh, sort by height, and you can see on the left side, there's MC retention time. Um, somehow I dropped the ID column. And maybe if that's also the case for you, uh, you can click on this plus button here. And uh, you can add the ID column, which is like scrolling down and selecting ID, just if you don't have it, yeah? And the same is true for MZ and so on. Yeah, so ID is the feature ID, like the row ID. And this we're gonna use for aligning uh, different tools later on. So we export everything with the ID and then from Sirius, from HMS and so on, we get, like we keep the ID basically and we can uh, align all the results, merge them. And then here, then here um, we can see that we have the like a sample here. The color actually corresponds still to the uh, MS data file. So it's sometimes nice to directly align just with the colors and the plots and so on. And for now, we only have the height of this individual sample. I told you like we, we did all the processing on each sample. So there is going to be more um, parameters that we can also extract for each of the samples. And again, if I just click on the plus, I can scroll down and then we see all those like feature retention time, feature MZ and so on. So if I do feature retention time, it's going to open up the retention time here also on like a sample level. Yeah, so each sample, if we later have multiple in the, in the feature list, we can see the retention time shifting between the samples. And on the left side, it is the average retention time, average um, MZ, maximum area, maximum height. Yeah, so you kind of have to know what, uh, like how we um, collapse those samples. And so we don't need that here. I just gonna remove it. Um, so for the chromatograms, of course, uh, I can look at the area, for example, and if I sort them by a descending area, 
we can see that, first of all, we see all the shapes. I can increase that. It's going to take a little bit of time. And then we have all the chromatograms here. I can click in the charts and I can also zoom in here and then kind of look at the shapes here. Um, and so we can already see that the extracted iron chromatograms that we selected is really now like multiple peaks maybe that we have to separate. And that is what we did with SM smoothing. So we just try to kind of get rid of some of the uh, fluctuations. And then also with the uh, resolving R, yeah? And those suffixes are just set in the batch mode, yeah? And then we applied another filter, the isotoping, and there's multiple, multiple more filters that you can apply. But the most important feature list that we should open now is the aligned feature list. And if you go all the way to the bottom, um, there's the aligned feature list, gap fill, duplicate, correlated, and so on. And we double click on it. And in here, uh, now we're gonna see that shapes actually has multiple samples. Um, just one note. Uh, that's, that's, just that's kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, just one note, there was already a question. Uh, if you don't have uh, as many um, yeah, lists in the feature, uh, as many items in the feature lists uh, atop, um, what you did then, uh, or like what, what the reason for it is, is that uh, during the filters, it was probably uh, set uh, to remove. And the remove does, um, or what it affects is it will remove every in the, uh, intermediate feature list. So, um, Right here, uh, we first of all want to wanted to keep the intermediate results. So we can then say, okay, at this point, um, we, for example, lost some important feature and um, this is where we want to optimize something. But uh, if uh, you have had it on remove, that's, I, I would say it's not a big problem. You can just um, either, you just say create batch again uh, with uh, yeah that um, tag uh, set to keep or uh, you just follow along with us and yeah. Yeah, we're not gonna use those lists a lot, you know, and like in those steps that we use them, you can definitely just look here, but a very fast way now that we save the preset and everything would be we go to the wizard, we open that session thing, like the, the presets that we did. And in here, we just change it from remove to keep, create the batch and run it again. And we're gonna get like, new lists being generated. Um, but okay, so you can follow along and just double click on the aligned uh, feature list. And if you do that, it opens up uh, a feature list tab up here. You already see there's like a checkbox. So we could also like check it and then check like different feature lists in the same thing, or we just open multiple tabs. That's all right. Um, then here we also again see the different shapes and it kind of makes sense to at least go for kind of like the very abundant thing. So if we sort by area or height, uh, you can see that of course, like the nice uh, feature shapes or here could also be like two isomers kind of like a um, bit, bit separated maybe, but we can see that now we have multiple um, features with different colors so different samples detected in different samples. And we can all, all also like, kind of like Stefan did, we can look at the retention time differences. We can look at the shapes if they change. And if they change, there might be like a like problem in the chromatography, right? Um, but it looks, it looks pretty good here. And this is only a representative set of samples. So really, if you do different batches, try to get a representative number of samples into the optimization of the batch. And we can also see that maybe sometimes uh, things are not separated. Like sometimes here uh, in the black sample, it was actually like creating one feature and then very likely split split away uh, like the other features that we see here in like all the other samples. But in the other samples, the separation of the, was not uh, clear enough. And so it failed to separate them. We can go back to the parameters and can optimize this, and we can also do that later. But um, it's very good to find those cases and maybe even note down the uh, MZ and retention time so that you later on can just check out um, in the resolving step and also in the alignment step. And we talked about the alignment and we said that we did set up the alignment very, very wide. Uh, it was 0.4, that's a lot. 
uh, especially for like a nine minute UHPC gradient with very narrow peaks. And why did we do that? So most likely, or maybe at least for me, um, you don't see the alignment columns here, but if I go on plus, there's a toggle button and toggle alignment columns will bring you um, the alignment columns or if you had them, we'll remove them. Yeah, so make sure you have them and follow along. So in the alignment columns, we have multiple different columns here that kind of try to give us an idea how well the alignment worked. And there's, first of all, these, there's the alignment rate and we can uh, like click twice and sort it from maximum to uh, minimum. And of course, an alignment rate of one is 100%. So we did align in all eight samples, also tells here aligned features, all eight samples had one feature aligned. And now we have this extra features here. And I want to show you how you can use this extra features to really kind of see like, what is the maximum difference of my retention time, maximum difference of my MZ uh, by looking at the whole feature table. So we sort by rate and then we sort by extra features. And if we then go all the way on the top, we should have full alignment and no extra features. Yeah. And that means that there was only like one chance in each sample for like a matching MZ and retention time. Yeah, so the features are defined by those two properties in this data set. And so if we look here, uh, we can even like zoom in and we can see that there was eight uh, features in all of the samples and there was no shoulder, there was no extra feature, no isomer in this very wide retention time range. But now if we, if we just consider that we have 88 samples, what is the perfect uh, retention time tolerance that we should set up, right? If there's another batch, there might be shifts. And so we kind of have to account for that. And so the extra features just count the number of uh, additional features in a sample that were not aligned with this feature. Yeah, because there can only be one feature per sample aligned to this, this row. Yeah, only one feature per sample. So if we have two in a sample, one is gonna be extra feature. Yeah, and if we have more, even more so. Um, but so to me, I think it's very nice to find those like we have full alignment or at least very high alignment rate. We have no extra features. So there was no isomer, no shoulder that could have kind of messed up our alignment. And if we now look at the maximum delta MZ and maximum delta retention time, doesn't say it's maximum, but uh, yeah, I know it's maximum. Maybe we should actually write it here. Um, we can see that for uh, some features, like this one, for example, has a very weird shape. Uh, is like 0.05. Then this one with like good shapes is like 0.02. If you ever feel like there's not enough uh, digits, like you want to see more significant figures on uh, retention time, MZ, and so on, you can go to the preferences and there's like the formatters for all the different values. Okay? You could just change that, reopen the um, overview, the feature list, and then you're gonna see more significant figures. Then, um, so here I would now basically just go through and kind of see like, what is the maximum difference uh, that I still feel like that it actually makes sense, right? Maybe the shape is really like twisted at like eight minutes or at two minutes. And I can also export the whole table. And if you have some like Python skills, R skills or something downstream, you can of course also plot this in a histogram or just you know just uh, look at it in a in a different way and extract your parameters from there, yeah. But I would definitely say we can already see that maybe something like 0.1 would be okay. Yeah, it's not too wide. Like we don't open up too wide to really align everything. But if we extrapolate from those eight samples to 88 samples, there might be a greater shift in there. Yeah. So we could we could start with something like 0.1. Yeah, so now I would go back to the wizard or to the batch mode and just change those parameters. Don't follow along here. I just want to show you how you could do that. It's project batch mode. Batch mode is actually the most important tool in MZMind because this really runs all the parameters, like all the modules that you set up, all the steps, and it's also reproducible. So you can save it 
which we did not do yet. Like you can save this once it's optimized and then you should definitely share this file with your paper. Yeah, so that people can reproduce. And so in here we have the join a liner step and I would just open it. And in here you see the 0.4 that we set and was on purpose, like way too high. And we can set it to 0.1, yeah? Not gonna do it now. It's just like for you to see, like you just open the batch mode, change the parameters. And once it's optimal, you save it and you keep it and you share it with your lab members and everyone else. And so I think the alignment you can use for this. And also, of course, uh, we want to look at the extra features being like drastically too high. Um, we can already see it's very much because we opened the alignment window to 0.4 plus minus. So that's a lot. Um, but also looking at um, some here, um, I guess there's going to be somewhere we have like eight samples and then, okay, like 16, but the shape is also weird. Um, I guess there's going to be something. Okay, let's go from, okay, let's go from here. So we have eight uh, features aligned and very often you can also see something like that. Like um, we have eight aligned features and then there's uh, seven or eight extra features. What does that very often mean is that there's just one isomer that is detected in all the samples. And so you really have like eight features for that one and eight features for the other one. And they were really so close that the alignment had to distinguish and say, okay, you are the one and you're the other one. Um, and then we just have to hope for that there's not uh, too great of uh, like retention time shifts and so on. If I want to see that and really want to um, go into the samples, I could now just right click and show and open the XIC dialog quick. And if I do this, might be taking taking some time because it needs to get all the data from uh, from your drive again. Um, in MZ Mine, to make it possible to process so many files, we have some mechanism where we use the fast uh, storage in your device um, so that we have more memory to process. But that also means that sometimes there's a lag when you haven't touched data for a long time, it kind of goes in like hibernation mode and then we need to touch it again to um, make it available. And so in here, we can even see, I mean, there's not much of a chance to wait. No, it should actually be those. Oh, wait, no, it's actually the big one. Yeah, so it's actually the big one. You see, like our settings were so outrageously um, big that like the left features that have no sh no color in it, they are the other compound, other isomer. isomer. And then on the right side, we have uh, the ones that were all collected and all aligned across all eight samples. Yeah, and you can see this is why we have now like eight extra features. Um, maybe for the other one, because on the other side, there's also more features, you're going to have more like 20 extra features or something like that. Yeah, so if you see that, you know, this one is not very good to uh, estimate the maximum differences, but the ones where there was no ambiguity um, with like zero extra features, we can really use to get the maximum shifts in our sample. We can get rid of the um, alignment columns here. And then, are you on? I thought uh, I heard something. Um, and so in the feature list now, um, you can really um, go to the side here and you can see that it looks way more complex than on the like slides that we showed uh, because there's also spectral library matching that we already applied. We also applied uh, molecular networking um, that we're going to look at after we introduce it. There's going to be a whole session tomorrow, but I think it's a very uh, like central um, topic to this whole, uh, whole workshop. So we're going to introduce it uh, today already. And then we can see on the right side all the different intensities across the samples. You see, now we have the aligned feature list. And one thing that I would like to look at is if I just sort by spectral library match here, if you don't have that again, there's the plus and toggle library matches. Yeah, toggle library matches to get them in and out. So we got them out and in. And so if I sort by spectral library match, I can right click and show the 
spectral libraries. I have to zoom down a bit, scroll down a bit uh, here, spectral DB search results. So right click on the row, show, and it needs to be, of course, one that has a, uh, has a match, right? And I, if I click on it, it's going to open this uh, dialog and you get the spectral library matches that we already saw in the presentation. So on the bottom, there's the reference data that we got from Mona from Mass Bank of North America, LCMSMS positive. And on the top, we have our own spectra. Uh, we can also kind of look into some metadata here and we can see, yeah, I cannot see because I zoomed in so much, um, but like on the side here, it also gives you like the collision energy maybe and who submitted uh, the spectrum. And then you could also can kind of uh, compare with the collision energy that you use for this sample. And some of the scores that are important up here is um, the big one is the cosine similarity. So we use very much like, uh, like the default uh, weighted cosine similarity. And then uh, if it's close to one, if it's one, it would be identical. Close to one is very similar. And then zero would be completely dissimilar. And usually you set a threshold. And I guess that question is going to come up a lot. Uh, what is a good threshold? Honestly, I don't know, really. Like, it's it's not so easy. Like, there's so many parameters you have to take into account. Typically, we use something like 0.7. Uh, but it also depends very much on, like, how many fragments do you really produce? And how default or how standard is your collision energy and everything that you apply? If there's nothing similar in, in the database, let's say we only have a spectrum from an orbit trap in this case, but our data would be QTOP, um, I'd rather have this like worst match and then maybe manually verify it if 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 it's if it turns out to be a significant feature, right? I'm gonna look into it and verify manually. Um, but it's still very hard. And of course, we can use other tools uh, like Sirius and other tools to then kind of double down on the annotation. Yeah, so we get the in silico annotation, we get the spectral library matches, we get some other tools to work on it, and hopefully they all tell us the same story. But they're also going to say us that tell us that there's some more ambiguity to it. Yeah, because how can I know that the hydroxy group is really on that side of the ring? Like, can it not be shifted? and produce a very similar fragmentation pattern. Yeah, right? Like if it's a uh, hexose, let's say, like how many hexoses are there, right? Too many. So, and the fragmentation patterns, if uh, we have a, let's say like a phenolic glucoside or we have some poly polyphenol with glucoside, like very often the charge is just gonna remain on the polyphenol and there's a lot of like hydroxy losses and whatever. And then um, the sugar is just cleaved off. So we don't have any clue if it's which, which sugar was really attached. So if you report that, always question yourself, right? It's like, and maybe to like also say there's a lot of different other molecules that also match maybe into that. Um, okay. And before we go into uh, the molecular networking part uh, in MC Mine, I would say it's kind of nice to, um, like we already looked at the alignment. The other thing that is very important to optimize is um, the resolving, yeah? And maybe first of all to this, anyone has some questions towards alignment, let's say, and resolving we do afterwards. Uh, you have three aligned peaks on this peak gaps. But, uh, what's the difference between the three of them? I mean this one? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, there's like so many because we, first of all, we kept all the intermediate steps and so we can backtrack what we, what the errors were. And if I open the batch mode, so control B or uh, in the menu, I can see that we applied 20 steps, right? And there was the alignment, which was the first step creating a, an aligned feature list. So multiple samples being aligned to one feature list. Then we had the featureless rose filter, um, which was mostly this like 10% of the sample should have a feature after alignment. So you can already see there might have been some hiccups in the alignment and feature detection in general. So don't be too strict. Um, then there is the peak finder. And that's actually a good question. Like what is peak finder and gap filling? Um, so you're never going to have perfect uh, 
like feature detection, never going to have perfect alignment. We already saw there was some features with like uh, some like shoulder or something. In some samples, you're going to see the shoulder. Some samples going to merge the shoulder more into the other feature. And so in some samples, we have two features and in others, we have one. And now what happens? I mean, if we process, we're going to have high significance maybe that this one feature is only present in this one sample. Right, but it's not really true. It's just uh, like it's been detected, but there's a lot of intensity of the same mass to charge ratio. The same ion was detected in the scans, which is just an artifact from the processing. So personally, I think that um, gap filling is a good way. It's like a secondary feature finding step. So we go back to the raw data, we extract um, the MZ and retention time ranges from the feature list. So we inform a second round of uh, feature finding and try to fill in the gaps. Yeah, so if I look into the feature list, so first, before we have the gap filling here, we have uh, the feature list, and I'm going to open it. Okay. I'm going to open it, and here you can see there's a lot of gaps. And the question is always like, is that real, or um, did we just miss something? And uh, so really like the gap filling just goes back into all the other files and tries to find this MZ and retention time range. And I would say if there is some intensity, I would rather want to see it than not have it. And I think the statistical analysis, there's a lot of debate if that's like comparable and so on. I personally think the statistical analysis is going to suffer more from all those like missing features that are very much there and a uh, high resolution mass spec is very narrow right so we have a very narrow window to actually extract intensities and if there's no signal there's nothing right so it's not gonna it's not gonna pick up so much trash i would say it's still gonna pick up trash but yeah um and also if you open um the gap filled uh, feature list then it might look a bit more filled and uh we can of course also add some columns to it you don't have to follow along. There's like feature state. So if I add this, uh, we're going to see that there's like blue, like here, blue is um, aligned. So it was the in, uh, in initial feature that made this row. And then gray is actually the ones that were gap filled. And you can see, okay, for those that are like kind of weird, um, the shapes are actually, at least there is some intensity. And also you might see that there's even like very large peaks uh, that were missing before. And the other two steps um, is just personal preference. And um, maybe we don't have to explain them so much, but there's a duplicate peak filter. We think that after gap filling, uh, we fill in the gaps. So the average MZ and average retention time is going to kind of traverse to the same value again for like the, the two duplicates. And then we can use the duplicate filter to uh, remove that row. Yeah, so there was like a, a shoulder and then we can remove some duplicates. And um, correlation grouping, we're going to look at um, in the network visualizer, but uh, we have some slides to kind of show that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because you imported too many samples. Um, so um, we, on purpose, because of course it slows down a little bit, uh, like plotting thousands of chromatograms in the table. And maybe if you have imported 100 samples, you are not very interested in looking at the shapes. The, up here, there's the toggle shape column. With a lot of samples, it's gonna just take some time, but you should also be able to kind of like just close this window and it should kind of kill all the tasks and you can also like right click and uh, stop all the tasks that are running if it really like takes just too long um this is kind of like a way we trigger this like compact table in the beginning and it kind of like drops a lot of um columns so that you don't see let's see like the mz and state and everything for each sample yeah so we have this compact table if you have a lot of samples Okay. Uh, in the past, uh, maybe I missed it, but in the past, you have to specify which file is used for alignment. There was two, two different zero versions. I think that was for GC, right? Like uh, which sample was, um, or was it Ransack? 
Um, we have like different alignment algorithms and um, for the join aligner, you don't have to specify any sample. Um, but yeah, there were some other algorithms maybe. Okay. Yeah. You have seen we override the previous threshold we use for noise or for uh, minim uh, minimum feature high or that's a good that's a that's a good question yeah um yeah we do apply different settings uh, on the gap filling features um and in some way it's even like an idea to do that because in the beginning i would be rather strict and i want to process uh, my data set fast enough you know let's say like 1000 samples one hour i want to be done um and then with gap filling i going to lose either way i'm going to lose some things and uh, so I'm rather strict. And then uh, with gap filling, I fill in the missing features. Yeah. And the, yeah, like the parameters, the constraints on, on peaks are very different. So um, in the gap filling module, peak finder, uh, you can see there's like an intensity tolerance, which is kind of like the shape. So a feature usually goes down. And if it goes up again by 20%, we say, okay, it's over. Like you don't, you don't go up again. Yeah. So it usually just goes down. Um, of course, um, like we don't apply even smoothing here, which we did uh, for the chromatograms in, in our case. If you see that your like stability of your chromatograms is very nice and you don't have any tips or anything, you can uh, just drop the smoothing. You can just remove that step up here. Yeah, just remove it, clicking here. Um, but really it's also about the noise. And we're gonna see that now with like the resolver, because if we resolve noise, if we wanna split, uh, peaks out of noise, we can produce like tens of thousands of features just being noise. Yeah. But it's a good point. Yeah. Like the peaks are definitely different. One more. Yeah. Um, either way, um, it's, it's, it's good that you say that. Um, so we did everything in the batch batch mode now, right? And honestly, the usual way is at one point, you're gonna have a batch file. You're gonna open it and apply the same batch to uh, your sample set because you already optimized those parameters. And if you don't need the graphical user, user interface, you can also run MZMine in, in like batch mode, like CLI on the command line interface. Yeah, and it's very easy. We have some documentation for that. So you just give it a batch file and the samples, and then it's gonna produce all the outputs. Um, but if you really just want to run one module, um, and that's actually what we're going to do now. Um, yeah, like you can select any of those feature lists. And for example, you saw that gap filling did not do a good job. You can go back to this one step where you have peak and you could either reduce your batch mode to just the steps that come after that and then run all the steps on this list. Or if you just want to try out different gap filling, you can say, feature detection, and then I have to find it actually, uh, feature list methods and gap filling, peak finder. Yeah, so we can apply the same method here and input some parameters. And that's when, what we at least gonna do now with uh, resolving. So again, there's, uh, and you can, you can follow along if you want, there's a feature detection and resolving, chromatogram resolving, local minimum resolver. And one thing I'd like to uh, show you, because we just added it, there's also quick access, control F, and then you open this guy. And it was for me because I always forget where things are. And then you just type in local, okay, that's enough, local M. And then you find the local minimum resolver and I hit enter and it opens up for me. Yeah, so you can double tap shift or you can control F, like search MZ mine, and then you can open the, uh, batch uh, like one individual module from there and in here um, this was actually the algorithm that we used for um, resolving the features like the chromatograms and we also have this show preview button down here so you select the checkbox you like shift it a little bit to show up yes and then on the bottom here, there's feature list, and you just select one of the feature lists, and you're going to see that there's extracted iron chromatograms on the top, and then SM for smoothed, 
And the smooth ones were the ones that we actually use. So you can select any that ends with SM. And if I do this, it's going to open up the feature list and uh, try to find a very noisy chromatogram and a good one. Seems like Stefan want to take over? No. Uh, I'm just, uh, I was informed that it would have been lunchtime now. So oh. the question is uh, for you, uh, would you rather um, like uh, go through this module uh, and um, yeah, see how the optimization works now, like before or after lunch? So yeah, I guess, that's a, that's a lunch, right? yeah, I guess yeah. actually yeah. now is a good time to have lunch. So it's up to you. Yeah. Uh, but I guess the, com uh, or like at I least, yeah, Robert yeah, wants lunch. So the, we, we take a lunch break and because we continue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to say and highlight. Uh, so there's going to be uh, lunch again. And the very important is, of course, the people with, uh, special special uh, deliveries. So um, they are uh, going to be there and then also uh, vegetarian. If you did not sign up for anything special vegetarian, please leave that for everyone else and then uh, like grab the ones uh, that are like the best of us. Okay. And yeah, so also just want to add that people who signed up for the uh, for the last four and who are in group number three. So that's going to be uh, in 40 minutes. You will start. We can all meet up by the uh, table.